Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be together again. I um, want to just uh, pray before we open up God's Word. Uh, we're once again back in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 14, in our series called The uh, Acts of the Risen Christ. Today's sermon title is Remaining True to the Risen Christ. Let's pray um, uh, just before uh, we begin. Uh, I guess I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ross Callahan. Uh, I'm pastor of Granville Community Baptist Church, Sydney, Australia. Um, so good to uh, be able to um, share uh, through technology. But let's pray. Uh, let's give thanks to God for today, uh, the Lord's Day, and let's give him thanks for his great grace. Heavenly Father, we want to just thank you and praise you this morning. Uh, we want to thank you first and foremost for uh, your grace upon us and especially as a country. We want to thank you for our godly leadership and our government and health officials that have acted so swiftly uh, to, um, I guess, uh, to stop and prevent uh, further widespread uh, uh, virus uh, infections. We want to thank you. Lord, for your grace upon our church that uh, we have no indication that there are uh, any persons with or that have contracted COVID-19. So we just ask for your uh, grace to continue to be poured out upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask as we open up your word to really give us um, hearts that are soft and pliable we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us and open our hearts and minds to your great truths within the book of Acts. We thank you for Luke's um, uh, mind and his writings uh, here today and how these truths are not only helpful for the early church but for the church today. And we pray those things in Jesus Wonderful name. Well, um, I hope this works. It's just a little bit of a uh, a, uh, a PowerPoint, just a touch. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the ABC show called Checkout. It has a segment called Product uh, versus Pack Shot or Pack Shot versus Product. And there we have a uh, double cheeseburger, I think it is, uh, the pack shot. And, of course, there we have the double cheeseburger in reality. Here's another one. Oh, there we go. There is a shepherd's pie. I'm quite partial to shepherd's pie, probably the, the Scottish English heritage, but um, there's the actual shepherd's pie. Uh, yeah, uh, not that appetising. Last one. Hang on a second. Sorry. Ah, there's the pizza. Maybe that was the last one. Um, looks inviting, but there's the pizza. It looks like something your animal has thrown up, um, unfortunately. Uh, so the point of all that was that, um, you know, Unrealistic expectations can bring disappointment, even when it's uh, uh, with something as simple as food. But unrealistic expectations can be much more serious um, than just getting a bad burger or a, a bad-looking pizza. Uh, with the coronavirus world pandemic taking the spotlight of every news uh, bulletin, uh, I saw that uh, President Trump announced that the coronavirus would actually um, not affect America, that by Easter they would be sort of back to normal, he said. Um, in my view, uh, that would be giving the American public, and I think it has done, a large dose of disillusionment and, of course, disappointment. In Acts 14, Luke, the author, wants his readers to know that 
that being a follower of Christ isn't going to be an easy road. He wants them to have realistic uh, expectations about what Christianity is really all about. Luke's told us some amazing events throughout the book of Acts and the spread of the gospel is going uh, gangbusters. It's just um, all sorts of people are getting saved, brought to Jesus through the gospel. Wonderful workings of the spirit, you might remember, a number of incredible miracles and uh, there's one in today's passage. But one of the main themes in the book of Acts is the theme of suffering. You might remember as we saw in Chapter 4 when the apostles preached the gospel, uh, there was great persecution that broke out against them. Uh, Chapter 5 as well. Chapter 6 sits in our minds uh, particularly when Stephen was stoned to death and, of course, Saul uh, stood there uh, and held the coats. Um, And although the risen Christ is reigning from the right hand of God, and the mission of God is going forward, uh, there's going to be opposition and there's going to be hardships for all who have called Jesus their Lord and Saviour. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's get back to the passage uh, in Chapter 13, just the chapter before. Paul and Barnabas, you might remember, have been kicked out of Pisidian Antioch and they're heading for Iconium. And let me remind you again, this is the first mission trip. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, persecuted by the Jews, both uh, uh, both Jews and Gentiles uh, here, are up in arms about their presence in the city. Let's pick it up. Chapter 14, the book of Acts, verses 1 to 3. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. As you heard there, both... uh, Jews and Greeks are being saved, but some of the Jews are stirring up trouble against Paul and Barnabas, verse 4 and 7. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles, uh, both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lycanian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continue to preach the gospel. It's a preacher's nightmare, isn't it? You are preaching and some people are getting saved. There's great working of the spirit and some people want to kill you uh, by stoning you to death. Uh, yeah. um, anyway, um, they move on. Point two, mistaken for gods, if you're looking uh, at our outline, we have and we'll post that out. I think you might have already received that from our secretary. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame, verse 8. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that the man jumped up and began to walk. Sound familiar? Bells should be ringing all around. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a copy, isn't it, a carbon copy of Chapter 3 when Peter uh, met the lame man at the uh, Gate of Beautiful outside the temple and uh, commanded him to stand up and walk. You know, um, the crowd are just amazed. Look at verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycanian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and reeds to the city gates because he 
and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. I mean, this is just crazy, isn't it? They've got a crowd there that are thinking they're their Greek gods, their cultural gods, and they want to sacrifice all these things to them. And the apostles, we won't read it in verses 14 to 17, are just tearing their clothes. They're just uh, so perplexed by their reaction because they just want them to see that Jesus is who they should worship. Paul and Barnabas just want them to turn from these useless gods and worship the true God and creator of everything. And Paul gives a sermon that uh, outlines that. Um, sort of an offhand sermon. But instead they want to worship Paul and Barnabas and it only gets worse. Some of the crowd that was against them uh, in Iconium came, of course, the Jews, and they stirred up and won over the crowd and Paul and Barnabas are in real trouble right now, verse 18 to 19. Even when... Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. Wow, what a fickle crowd, eh? Paul gets stoned. I mean, one minute they're hearing the gospel responding and worshipping them, the next minute they're stoning them to death. You know, Paul gets left for dead, dead and the disciples gather around and I can only guess that they prayed as they saw their Lord do many times. Boy, <laughs> you know, what a scene. Verse 20 and 21, but after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. <clears throat> they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch. Boy, that would have been pretty scary, wouldn't it, going back into the cities that you, know, you were stoned? And the next day, off to, to Derby, no time for debriefing up and left, and here they win a large number of people to the Lord Jesus and they become disciples, Luke tells us. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, Just going to show you uh, just briefly uh, the map. I don't know if you can see that, if that's uh, visible on that screen. It's a little bit bright, I know. But instead of, you know, I guess going home, because they weren't far from home. What do they do? (laughs) They return to the very place that they'd been persecuted. Let's pick it up, verses 21b to 22. Then they return to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Such courage, isn't it? Such a statement and really an incredible thing to say to the disciples. They go back to the place that they'd been threatened and nearly stoned to death to encourage the new believers. And you must see what the purpose was for doing this. They want the believers to know that they must go through some real hardships if they want to enter the kingdom of God. The point and the key verse of the whole section is to make it clear that they must suffer persecution and hardships. And if they're going to continue to follow in the faith, and qualify for the entrance into the kingdom of God, they must understand this and suffer those hardships. Paul is not talking about becoming a Christian when he says we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. He's talking about welcome 
being welcomed into the kingdom of heaven at the end of life. He's talking about what Jesus said when he told his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No one who takes his hand off the plough is fit for the kingdom of God. Paul's talking about relentlessly running the race that's set before him, before us as uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as the writer of the Hebrews says. You see, it seems that Luke wants his readers to see the theme of suffering in the broader framework of the inaugurated kingdom of God. What that means is this. Yes, the kingdom of God has come and Jesus is reigning and building his church. Nevertheless, because the kingdom is not yet consummated, not yet completed, the growth of the church and the fortifying of the Christian faith will take place in the midst of suffering. God's people will be strengthened by being aware that hardships and suffering are part of the Christian life. Forewarned is being forearmed. This is an important reminder for us at this point in time, isn't it? Personal trouble, trials, and even a global pandemic are just some ways that God will use to strengthen our stance in Christ. And, you know, Paul uh, perhaps was recalling this whole ordeal and the need for God's strength and his, his mind to be steadfast, knowing that he must go through suffering when he wrote later in the letter or the second letter to Timothy. Chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Let me read it to you. You know about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love and endurance, persecutions and sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Or just as the Apostle Paul says here to the believers in Acts, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Dear brothers and sisters, hear me now. Expecting the Christian life to be full of champagne and roses is like expecting that microwavable double cheeseburger to be the best cheeseburger you've ever tasted. Nah, not going to happen. But when we are strengthened by the knowledge that we are going to face troubles, struggles and persecution, we are not saying that God is against us or angry with us, but what we are saying is that suffering is the consistent norm that every Christian who wants to take up their cross and follow Jesus will experience. You know, people heckling us behind our backs for our Christian faith, others opposing us and calling us bigots on different social issues or perhaps just treating us differently is part and parcel of what being a Christian is all about. And it's why we must take stock and realise that this is normal for the Christian and for all who want to be part of the kingdom of God. You know, church, we not only need to embrace this ourselves, but we need to arm our future generations with the same knowledge so that they don't walk away from the faith when things get tough. We don't want them to be fair-weather Christians, do we? They need to be willing to live for the gospel and stand in the grace of God in times of distress and trouble. 
and we know they're coming. Paul's preaching, of course, brought division, a great division in this chapter, and it'll do the same today. Jesus said those words, didn't he? Matthew 10, 34. Don't think that I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. What he's saying is there's going to be division. People are not going to accept the gospel and they're going to persecute the Christian just the same as they persecuted Christ, as he said later in the gospel. Our society has been, <clears throat> pardon me, slowly turning away from Christianity and Perhaps it's time for the church to once again wield the sword of the spirit and preach the word of God in clear and faithful ways because sadly our society is abandoning the faith just at a time when faith is fundamental to living in a world that or where suffering is on the increase. And with that comment, let's grasp the reason why Paul went through the trials and the persecution that he did. He did this so that the church would be strengthened and so that they would enter the kingdom of God. That is the heart of a pastor. That's my heart this morning, that you would be strengthened and so that you would enter the kingdom of God. If you're watching or listening today, I hope you see that that's the apostles' motivation for going back into those cities, back to the church, back to the people who have heard the gospel and believed it. As the gospel writers say that he who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's Paul's motivation. Perhaps you've never received the gospel message and placed your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Perhaps you've never received that gift of eternal life and salvation. Then let me encourage you to do so today. A day when faith is more precious than gold. And let's not forget how Paul recalls that the Lord delivered him from all those circumstances, not just in Antioch. You know, when he shakes the dust off his feet and they walk away, they get booted out. Not just in Iconium where the plot to kill him was uncovered and not just at Lystra after he was stoned and somehow revived. You see, God's rescue comes in different ways and at different times and the outcome or the outcomes might be totally different. But nevertheless, as Paul says, God rescued him out of all these troubles and he will rescue us in some way, shape or form. Maybe you're in need of God's rescue today. As I said, if you haven't uh, become a Christian, if you haven't received that gift of salvation, that entrance into the kingdom of God, then you can do so today quite easily by just asking Jesus to forgive your sin and come into your, to your heart and that you would swear allegiance to him, that you would follow him for the rest of your days, take up your cross, endure suffering, persecution, and, of course, being maligned maybe by your friends and family um, so that you would follow Christ and enter kingdom of heaven. And let's be reminded, uh, dear brothers and sisters, by Luke's closing comments. Let me read them to you from chapter 14, verses 23 to 28. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word, but in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God 
for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Paul's pattern, of course, was to appoint elders in every church so that they would be strengthened and taught the word of God. Paul's gone back there to those cities to confirm the importance of the truth of the gospel, of which he was not ashamed, of which he knew was the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believed. Paul wanted these new believers who'd been won by these great truths to plumb the depths of these truths so that they would be established in the grace of God and in the gospel message. Paul's later letters to the churches in Colossae, Ephesus and Philippi confirms his supreme purpose and passion, that they might have full knowledge of the gospel truths so their faith would be mightier, their love would be more sincere and their hope would be brighter and clearer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew for the full triumph of the gospel to take effect in their lives, they needed to be taught the scriptures, soaked in prayer and brought into constant fellowship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul then charges them with the great truth that they must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom has arrived, yes, and it has been established, but it isn't consummated yet. And there will be a drawing of men and women into the kingdom into its fold. And Paul realises these great truths, these deep spiritual truths, that to bring men and women into the kingdom of God will take all their effort. It'll take more than that. You know, Paul has entered into a, a battle. He talks later in these letters. It's not a war with clearly defined battle lines but a spiritual war that requires a consecration to God where the armour of God is drawn upon daily, where the shield of faith is lifted high and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, is wielded. These are divine weapons that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10.4, divine weapons that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds and the breaking open of people's eyes to see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. In conclusion, or just before I conclude, are you ready? Are you engaged in this battle? Have you taken up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and have you soaked yourself in prayer? At a time where we can't uh, gather as a community, we can by great technology. Let's not forsake gathering together, as the Hebrew writer tells us in 1025. And are you taking up, I guess, the armour of God, what God has given you in Christ Jesus? Stand strong, brother and sister, and let's battle. Let's wage war for those who are out there outside of Christ, who need to be won by the great truths of the gospel message, the power of God unto salvation to all who would believe. In conclusion, it was God's grace that they were committed to. It was God who opened the door for them to preach the gospel, and it was God who had worked through them. And as John Stott says in his commentary in the book of Acts, the grace came from him. The glory must go to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word of encouragement and the way that you want to strengthen us 
and armors so that we know that we must go through hardships if we want to enter the kingdom of God. I pray for every person that's listening right now that they would be strengthened by your great grace. They'd stand firm in the gospel, the gospel that saved them. And I pray for those who are out there that don't know you, Jesus. I pray right now that they would pray this simple prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean by your blood. I believe that you died for me and that you were raised to life to give me eternal life. I put my faith and trust in you today. And I pledge that I want to live for you and follow you all the days of my life. Please put your spirit in my heart and seal me as one of your own people and strengthen me as you teach me through your Holy Spirit, the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, if you prayed that prayer, please jump on the website, uh, Granville Baptist uh, and or dot com, and uh, and please, uh, you know, talk to a friend. Uh, look up on YouTube uh, some more sermons. Get fed the Word of God. Uh, God bless church. Uh, we're going to be. Uh, coming to you next week uh, in the book of Acts, but we're going to have a small segment um, for the Anzacs um, as they probably won't be marching. And um, in the following week, we're going to have a communion service. So God bless. Uh, may you be strengthened by God's word today. Have a great week.